All right. Good afternoon for some and good morning to others and welcome to the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association's webinar on innovation and partnerships in youth homelessness. I'm Dominika Kshaminska, Director of Programs and Strategic Initiatives at CHRA and I will be your host for today's webinar. Thank you all for joining us. Before we begin, I will give a brief overview of the webinar technology. I will then introduce our agenda and speakers for today's presentation. Today's webinar is in real time. You should now be able to see a title screen of today's presentation and be able to hear me via your computer speakers, headset, or through your telephone if you have chosen to dial in. You are currently all muted and we do this to minimize background noise. However, if you wish to ask questions, which we encourage you to do so, you may. You basically type your question into the dialog box on the webinar control panel at any time during the presentation. We will address as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar during the question and answer period. If at any point you're having problems with the technology, Mark Hughes here at, the, here at the CHRA office is available to help. You can either send him a message through the chat dialog box on the webinar control panel, making sure you select him as the recipient, or give him a call at 613-594-3007, extension 22. Moving on to the agenda for today, CHRA is pleased to have with us Stephen Gates, Director at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness and Professor at the Faculty of Education at York University, Melanie Redman, Executive Director of Away Home Canada, and Aon Shahed, Director of Strategic Development at Choices for Youth. This webinar will present new ideas and models for changing the landscape of services and support systems for homeless youth. Starting with what youth homelessness looks like in Canada, the webinar will highlight a housing first framework for youth. It will then discuss the recently launched Making the Shift Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Lab and provide examples of social innovation in action from Choices for Youth Social Innovation Project in Newfoundland and Labrador. I now have the pleasure of introducing to you our presenters. Stephen Gates is the director of the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, a professor at York University's Faculty of Education and the president of Raising the Roof, a leading Canadian charity that focuses on long-term solutions to homelessness. Dr. Gates is committed to a research agenda that foregrounds social justice and attempts to make research on homelessness relevant to policy and program development. His research on homeless youth has focused on their economic strategies, health, education, and legal and justice issues. And more recently, he has focused his attention on policy and in particular, the Canadian response to homelessness. Melanie Redman is the executive director of Away Home Canada. Prior to this role, Melanie was the director of national initiatives at EVAS. She currently serves as the chair of the Youth Homelessness Research Priority Area at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. Melanie's passion for addressing the root causes of complex social issues drew her to co-develop Away Home with partners across Canada. Aon is the Director of Strategic Development at Choices for Youth in Newfoundland and Labrador. In his role, he oversees all aspects of fund development and communications and provides thought and operational leadership on the organization's strategic direction, partnerships, and high-level initiatives. Aon is also the Regional Director of Newfoundland and Labrador on the Canadian Housing and Renewal Association's Board of Directors. Welcome Steve, Melanie, and Aon. I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. So we're going to all present in the order that you introduce us. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, the role of research and how if we want to really create a change through the use of research, how it necessitates collaboration. If we want innovation, how it requires that researchers work with uh, people in the community, people with lived experience, um, uh, people in government, that kind of thing. And so I'm going to go through and give some examples, um, including the development of the Housing First for Youth model. But I'm going to start with this, the first place I'm going to start here is in talking about what we mean by community-engaged scholarship. And this became really of interest to me when I used to work in the homelessness sector uh, in the 1990s, throughout most of the 1990s. At that time, there was a real, um, you know, people tended to, to see homelessness as this, youth homelessness as a seemingly intractable problem. Next. Um, and something that, you know, is, we 
were struggling with and and people didn't really see a role for research or value it. Next, uh, the common thing that you hear all the time, you still hear this every now and then today, but back then it was kind of like a, a chorus. You know, we don't need research. We know what the problem is. We know what the solutions are. And I think people were wrong on all three of those levels, right? Like research, I can't imagine any issue in society, whether it's cancer or uh, climate change or, or anything where we would say research is irrelevant. But there was a struggle there. Like, how do we make it matter? How do we, how do we create a situation where it's going to have impact? And the, the, the key here is, again, through community-engaged scholarship, which, as you can see from this definition, is defined by partnership. Right? We, we want researchers to work collaboratively uh, across sectors, across, uh, you know, w with different groups of people, and then we can come up with new solutions and innovation. Next. The, uh, but that's easier said than done. One of the things, one of the things that uh, is a challenge is that these are kind of, you know, three solitudes, research, policy, and practice. Next. So what we need to do is figure out how do we create an overlap, right, between these three so that we respect that there are different roles and different kinds of knowledge that are valued, but that somehow at the center, there's a space where if we collaborate, it will benefit everybody. Next. And, but some of the challenges to these are, are really key here, right? The, um, the um, just one second here. Um, there, are, there are limitations uh, in terms of how researchers produce their work and disseminate it. It's like nobody, including me, and I'm even a researcher, you know, like most of the time I find academic articles quite boring. Sometimes the language is a barrier. And often the focus of the work isn't really on um, what people need, right? So that's a problem. There's, uh, for users in the field, right, they really need research that addresses their concerns, that fits into their time frames, right? If we had someone 150 page support and say, this is really good, we have to understand that not everyone can set aside hours and hours of pouring through that. Um, a lot of this challenge comes from a lack of meaningful engagement between these different worlds, right? So how do researchers work with policymakers and how do service providers or people in the community engage with researchers? And then finally, we have to acknowledge that there are different institutional cultures and goals and timelines and all of these things that come, that can get in the way. So for a researcher, for instance, you might apply for funding in September and not receive it until the following year, and your research won't be done for three years. Well, that's not very helpful necessarily in the community. So we created the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness to basically engage in and mobilize research that is designed to have a, fo uh, a focus on, uh, an impact on solutions to homelessness. So from this diagram, you can see on the left, we collaborate with a whole range of institutions, groups, and people. We have, uh, eight research priority areas that intersect and overlap that we uh, created, co-created with that very diverse group of partners. And then we mobilize that research through the Homeless Hub, which many of you may be familiar with, and through other things, government relations, community engagement, that kind of thing, to actually have the research create impact. So that's the, the idea behind it. Let's look at some examples of community-based scholarship in action. I'm going to give you three examples here. One is around advocacy as an outcome, one is around creating new program models, and one is about how, what role does research have to play in creating a national movement. So the first one here is collaboration that we engaged in over the past decade with uh, Justice for Children and Youth, which is a, a legal aid clinic in Toronto that works with young people with lived experience of homelessness. Now together we talked about like what are the issues at play there. Young people, those of you who do the work will know that young people who experience homelessness face numerous legal and uh, justice issues, challenges, everything from dealing with landlords to employers to accessing benefits to treatment by the police. We know that young people who are homeless experience criminal victimization at rates that are exponentially greater than for house youth. We know that one of the problems in this country at a policy level is that one of the ways we deal with homelessness besides programs and services is we use law enforcement. We essentially criminalize homelessness 
and use law enforcement to deal with what is an economic and social issue. And then finally, this is more Ontario specific thing, but um, when Mike Harris was in government, they put in place the Safe Streets Act, which is a terrible piece of legislation that basically outlawed panhandling and squeegeeing, and has led to uh, millions, millions of dollars worth of tickets being issued to people who essentially have no money to pay. What are they going to do? Panhandle and squeegee to pay the tickets? It's horrible act. So, what we did is we did research with young people, uh, interviewed, um, I believe, 250 young people. We did reports, several reports. We did uh, all, produce all kinds of materials. We engaged the community after. We engaged the police services. Um, this is all around 2010, 2011. Since then, there have been more developments. You can see in this slide here, uh, Michael Bryan, former Attorney General, a couple of years ago got interested in repealing the Safe Street Act. So we went in a campaign to repeal the Safe Street Act. And so here's the outcome. Nothing's changed, right? So that's really good collaborative work, but unfortunately, the Safe Street Act is still in place. It's horrible and it's creating harm to people. So we learn a lot about how to do collaborative work, uh, but it doesn't always lead to the outcomes we want. Next. This next one here is uh, development of a, a program model, Hungry First for Youth, which is uh, an adaptation of the Pathways, the mainstream model. And this came through collaboration between the Free Youth Planning Collaborative in Hamilton, the National Learning Community on Youth Homelessness, and Away Home Canada right when it was at its beginning stages. So uh, the issues that we're looking to address is that at the, you know, the federal government renewed the homelessness partnering strategy, uh, prioritized housing first. Not housing first for youth there, but it required that communities invest in housing first, um, and many communities were doing that. Now this isn't a bad thing on its own, but many people in the community felt were, did not feel that Housing First as a program model worked well with youth. That in fact, um, the uh, at home Chiswa research showed that the outcomes for young people under 25 are not so great. So, the, you know, I remember in a meeting in Hamilton, we were having a conversation and, and people were saying it's, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And, and I was feeling, well, the research on Housing First as a model is pretty compelling. Maybe the problem is, is that we haven't adapted the model to the needs of developing adolescents and young adults. And so working with uh, Street Youth Planning Collaborative in Hamilton and, and then engaging the national learning community on youth homelessness and, and away home around thinking about how we take these things to scale, we, uh, we interviewed a bunch of young people we, and uh, talked to service providers, talked to people in government, and we came up with this framework for Housing First for Youth and, 2014. And I'm just going to go through a little bit here about what it involves. It's actually, even though it comes out of Housing First, there's an important distinction here, right? The, the goal here is not simply to get people housed. The goal is not simply recovery. We're talking about young people, so we also have to think about how do we assist young people to enable them to make a successful transition to adulthood. So in doing that, we had to alter the program model. You can see here through the core principles, some of the things are um, uh, similar to the Housing First um, Pathways model, but some are different. Key here is a focus on positive youth development and a wellness orientation, right? So our, we have to think about the young person and what any young person needs and build the model around that. We need to do better around social inclusion and community integration, these kinds of things, like helping young people build natural supports, that kind of thing. We have to focus it around youth. Next. We also have to think about housing options differently. Um, for young people, the, the kind of housing that they need will depend on their developmental level, uh, it will depend on their age, that kind of thing. And so we need alternatives though, and it's important, it's not emergency shelters, but we need some kind of temporary place-based crisis housing for young people. But the, where they might go through a Housing First for Youth program, they may return home, right, with support and ongoing support from the Housing First case manager. They may wind up in some kind of supportive housing or transitional housing. And 
Again, they will be in those programs but still be clients of the Housing Choice for Youth program, and then they may be in independent living. They may want scattered site housing. They may also change their mind along the way. One last thing about that model, though, if you involve young people in supportive housing or transitional housing, they remain the client of the Housing First program and then have to transition to some kind of permanent or independent living. The support model is broader than the Housing First model as well. Um, it involves um, uh, other things like access to income and education, better work around social inclusion, that kind of thing. So the model is different, and the outcomes now are quite interesting. That's the, uh, there's growing interest in this model in Canada. Uh, there's international uptake. In fact, this framework has taken off more in Europe, one could argue, more quickly than in Canada. And then there's the Making the Shift demonstration project that, that uh, Melanie Redman will be talking about. Next. Okay. So the third thing here, and this is the biggest, is creating a movement to prevent and end youth homelessness. Away Home Canada, Melanie will explain how it is a, a coalition and the coalition model, how it works. But research is part of this process. We've done, this is perhaps an area where we've had the most successful level of collaboration. We've done reports, policy briefs, a lot of work. Next. All of this came from the creation of a national youth homelessness research agenda, co-created between researchers, practitioners, policymakers, people with lived experience. Next. Uh, and on this list, we have a, what, what formed our research agenda. And if you can just click through the slides here, you'll see that basically one by one by one by one, we've achieved all of these things, except the last one is still in process. Next. One of the key pieces that we've did, done is a national, the very first national survey on youth homelessness. Next. This involved, uh, you know, over 1,100 youth participants, but you can see from here, we engage 57 different agencies across Canada Health to deliver this. Next. And I'm going to go through some of the key findings. I might flip through some of these to make sure that we can stay on time. Uh, the first is around diversity. You can see that a third of young people who are homeless are uh, uh, LGBTQ2S, a third are Indigenous, and about a third are members of racialized communities. Next. The, um, this is one of the key findings from the report. 40% of all young people we surveyed had their first experience of homelessness before the age of 16. Next. Um, and of that group, they tend to be the ones with most adverse childhood experiences, the most, uh, you know, multiple episodes of homelessness, uh, the higher levels of suicidality, lots of problems. Next. We also found that, uh, here, we'll skip this slide, uh, that in Canada, 0.5% of Canadians have some involvement in child protection. Almost 60% of young people are homeless too. So that's important going forward. Next, life on the street. Um, I'm going to go quickly through this and just go some high level. We know that when young, we let young people become homeless, different things happen. The health worsens, mental health declines. All of these factors here are a result and an outcome of prolonged homelessness. Uh, young people don't have to stay homeless that long to have these things happen. The mental health issue is really important. We found in the survey 85% fell in the high symptom distress category, which means that if they were housed, they would be midway between inpatient and outpatient psychiatric, psychiatric care. Next. The dropout rate in Canada is now below 9% amongst homeless youth. It's over 50. Next. Over 50% of young people who are homeless are not in employment, education, or training. Next. Um, the other thing is the exposure to all kinds of violence on the streets. 38% of all young women on the streets have been raped in the last year. So exposure to this kind of thing leads to all kinds of mental health difficulties. And then uh, this is another thing that came, this wasn't from our study, but from the U.S., uh, which had included some Canadian communities. One in five young people are sex trafficked. So exploitation is a big issue. Next, uh, and young people have been homeless for the chronicity levels are quite high, right? But 31% are chronically homeless, 21, 22% are episodically homeless. Next. Uh, I'm going to talk very briefly about relationships, but to say this. Many young people have assets. They have lots of friends and positive relationships in their lives, but there's about a quarter who have very difficult or very disengaged, and this is a big challenge. Those are young people for whom they will need a lot of supports when they leave the streets. Next. And the, the, here's an important thing, is about family. Uh, 
71% had some contact with family, and 77% wanted more. And the problem is that in the youth homelessness sector, we often see family as part of the problem, part of the past, and we don't attend to it. But young people are telling us something more. So next, let's see what all this means. What are the implications for policy and practice? If we know the following, that many young people experience homelessness at a very young age, that many demonstrate high rates of housing instability, have had prior involvement in child protection, have high rates of adverse childhood experiences, mental health problems, et cetera, then it follows that we are waiting way too long to intervene. Most of our communities don't have anything in place for homeless youth until they're 16 or 18, yet the problems are appearing much earlier. Um, we also know that if we allow young people to remain homeless and to bootstrap themselves out, we're really creating a long-term problem. Um, they need to be assisted in exiting homelessness as quickly as possible. We also know that family and natural supports matter. If we're going to help young people, we have to build them that or help them build that. And um, we have to ensure that we do the right kind of supports, not housing first life, not just you know, uh, dump and run, throw someone in a house and throw the keys through the keyhole or through the envelope mailbox. Uh, we have to stick with them and give them the support they need for as long as they need. Next. Uh, so we need to consider prevention as well as housing first for you and look at all these things that are connected, right? How do we support young people leaving care when we know that there's a problem there? How do we engage schools? There, that's the canary in the mine shaft. Every young person who is homeless was in school at one point, and there was probably an adult who knew something was wrong. We need to intervene early, and we need to focus on family and natural support. Next. So this research report was released last year. Next. And we've had a number of policy briefs that have been actually having an impact. Uh, one focused on, on mental health, one on child welfare, and the most recent one at the bottom here was a policy brief to inform the government of Canada uh, as it renews its homelessness strategy. Next. So here, we'll just go through these quickly. Uh, people can see this slide later, but I think we've learned a lot about how to work effectively in partnership. There's still, a, it's not always easy, but we need to think about how to define roles, how to collaborate, how to develop and nurture relationships. It takes a lot longer to do research this way than a traditional way, but it's important. And finally, this is how we create impact. And I'm going to hand it over to Melanie Redmond now um, to talk about impact uh, through this great program or this great organization, Away Home Canada and the Making Shift Project. Thank you so much, Steve. And I wanted to just add to Steve's presentation that the next step around the Housing First for Youth framework um, is that we've been co-creating a program model guide called This is Housing First for Youth that will release the week of October 10th. And so that will be available, and it, it takes the framework and it really goes deep on what it looks like in terms of program implementation, case management, prioritization, et cetera, and even showcases some of the work that we're doing around outcomes with the project I'm going to talk about in my presentation. So thanks so much, CHRA, for having me. Um, it's exciting to be here. Change? Uh, slide change? There we go. Uh-oh. So we were having this debate, should we use the term change or next to get CHRA to change our slides? And so I think we might uh, switch them up a little bit to the surprises. <laughs> um, the question, um, building on Steve's presentation, can we end youth homelessness in Canada? And we believe we can. Next. So how are we going to do that? Um, a key point, youth homelessness is distinct from adult homelessness. Next. And if the causes and conditions of youth homelessness are unique, so must be the solution. And so how do we organize ourselves to make that happen? Um, so this is how we respond to youth homelessness in Canada right now. Um, a large emergency response, not a ton of focus in the other two areas. Next. Our collective work seeks to flip that around and with a big investment on prevention and big on housing and support. Um, but we will always need an emergency response, we understand. But what that emergency response looks like can also evolve. Next. So away home. What is this away home? Next. Next. It's a coalition. And so um, one of the things that we were supposed to really focus on in this webinar is partnership. And so I'm going to highlight the critical role of partnership in all the work that we're doing. And that starts with the name. Um, so what's in a name? 
um, we took the name um, from a body of work we were supporting um, in Kamloops, British Columbia, um, with uh, their youth homelessness community planning efforts. And the young people decided to name their efforts um, Away Home because they said that home means different things to different people and there's more than one way to get there. And we took that to heart and that our role as a coalition is to utilize the collective impact framework um, approach to ensure that young people are able to actualize themselves fully and find whatever home means to them. And so I think, you know, two of my heroes in this country in terms of innovation are Alec Mansky and Vicki Kamek. And you can read about their work online, but I encountered them early on when I immigrated to Canada. And they taught me something important, and it was, you can act like an organization, but you've got to think like a movement. And so A Way Home is thinking like a movement. Next. So, and you can put all these up on the screen at the same time. Um, so collectively, um, A Way Home has set a, a, group, a list of strategic priorities. And you can read through those, but I'm just going to refer back to them in the presentation. Um, some of our, our work that's um, most critical really is around um, developing a knowledge base and a research and evidence base around models of prevention and housing for, for youth so that governments and communities can implement and sustain and scale those efforts. Next. And so for A Way Home, um, we utilize uh, the Constellation model for dispersed leadership. I added the dispersed leadership part because I think it's really important to highlight. And so like Steve was talking about um, how we co-create the National Youth Homelessness Research Agenda. Um, well, A Way Home doesn't need to lead on that. We collaborate on that and the Canadian Observatory leads on that. Um, youth voice, um, elevating the voices of youth with lived experience, that's one of the most impor important partnerships we have. And so we have mechanisms for doing that. Um, another example before I move on would be the community of practice. Well, we host the National Learning Community on Youth Homelessness, practitioners from across the country working with young people, working to elevate their voices, and they lead the community of practice work. And so our model is around creating maximum impact and aligning our strategies and resources with partners across the country so that we get the job done. Next. Next. So partnership and collaboration. We're going to talk a little more about that. And can you go back one? You, you went a little too fast. There we go. Um, so the coalition members, you can see here, um, important to note that from the get-go, um, we were involving um, government at the table as equal partners. And next. Another important partnership that we have um, where we work a little bit differently than, um, you know, uh, most organizations do is we have a youth homelessness funders table um, that we can be in with the Catherine Donnelly Foundation. We um, need to add the Conconi Foundation logo because they've just signed on. And they do more than just fund our efforts. They're at the table with us strategically. And this partnership is critical because we really are trying to align things like outcomes a reporting mechanism, um, developing funding streams that speak to prevention and moving young people out of homelessness. Next. So collective impact, just a, a brief a brief overview of, of the role that that plays for us. Next. So collective impact is different than collaboration and there's a lot written out there. I think we need to do some writing about it as well. Um, but I think what's really important is bringing relevant actors to the table and to work toward a common vision, to work toward something, you know, that's bigger than ourselves. And, you know, the goal is to change outcomes for a population. It's not just to partner and to deliver a great service that's important in the lives of someone. It's to change the outcome at the population, the population level outcome. Next. So why collective impact? Um, collective impact is really fantastic when you're working with wicked problems. Next. And youth homelessness is a wicked problem, and I'm going to show you why next. So youth homelessness is what we're calling a fusion policy issue, in that um, there are many drivers for uh, young people to find their way to homelessness, but those same drivers can be part of the solution. And so collective impact requires us to work across those systems that can both be part of the problem and the solution. And for too long, we've asked uh, the youth homelessness serving sector, service providers, to be responsible for preventing and ending youth homelessness. And, and that's just ridiculous. We all have to 
uh, take the responsibility where it lies, and we have to work together to ensure that young people don't hit the streets. Next. So partnership and innovation. Next. So, you know, we had this, that question earlier on, right? Um, can we end youth homelessness in Canada? And then, you know, we launched this coalition and we co-create research agenda. And we've got, there are all this great stuff happening. But something that, that we thought was really important to drill into is building that, really, that solid evidence and evaluation base on models of prevention and housing first for youth and doing that in partnership. Next. So, oh, I have to, oh, yeah. This project is funded in part by the Government of Canada's Skills Link Program. I, I've, I've been required to uh, insert this into all presentations. So, um, and we are very grateful for the support of the Government of Canada on this, despite my humor. Um, so, Making the Shift. Uh, so, recently we launched something called Making the Shift, a Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Lab. And the, the initial project, phase one, is a partnership between Away Home. Canadian Observatory on Homelessness, and Mars Center for Impact Investing. And as I talk about the project, it will become apparent um, who's responsible for what and, and what, what strengths those partners are bringing to the table. Next. So it's also involved two provinces, 10 communities, and dozens of community partners. And those provinces are Ontario and Alberta. And we are um, prioritizing those two provinces in phase one because they have existing or emerging strategies to prevent and then use homelessness that we can build on when we start thinking about sustainability and scale. Next. So the container that holds this work of phase one and phases moving forward is the Youth Homelessness Social Innovation Laboratory. And it is by nature, it necessitates partnership at every level. And so, you know, if you have your glasses on <laughs> or a very big screen in front of you, you can see the strategic partnership, the international engagement required um, to basically um, take what we know through a process of insight of discovery, insight and discovery, what we know that's innovative, what we know has potential at the policy and practice level and do rigorous research and evaluation on those things in the Canadian context. Sometimes demonstration projects will be required to do that. Um, and then develop the tools and resources that communities and all orders of government need to implement, sustain, and scale those activities. And then mobilize that knowledge so that there's a true uptake in the community so that we have a shift, again, that visual, a shift to prevention and moving young people out of homelessness in a safe and planned way. Next. So the demonstration projects that will be running in phase one, I'll talk about, but I think it's important to look at this visual and how we're thinking about prevention, exiting systems, and exiting homelessness. And in some of these areas, we have a bit of an evidence base in the Canadian context, like the Youth Week Night, um, Mike Gillespie's work from the Raft in the Niagara region, um, a few pilots or small host homes host homes programs in various communities, um, some work on family mediation, um, family reconnection, but again, and, and then, you know, in school-based programs, we're doing a pilot with Raising the Roof um, Canadian Observatory and York Region and Niagara Region called the Upstream Project. But it, again, these are all things that, that are small, that haven't necessarily been rigorously researched and evaluated. And they definitely haven't been taken to scale in terms of policy and practice. Next. So for phase one, we're doing housing first for youth, the model that Steve was speaking to. Um, what we're calling this is housing first for youth. Um, in Ottawa, housing first for youth who are currently homeless. Toronto, housing first for youth exiting care before they become homeless. And in Hamilton, housing first for youth, indigenous youth and indigenous led. And so these are really exciting demonstrations. Um, we're also starting to bring other communities who want to do this work um, into the research and evaluation component so that we can build a stronger evidence base. Next. Prevention demonstration projects, and you can go ahead and populate that slide if you want. Um, my family and natural supports programming in all seven Alberta, the big cities, I guess. <laughs> um, and in Toronto, um, we're also doing family and natural support demonstration projects to take 
that work across the whole system in Toronto so that every young person who touches the system has access to these important supports. And then a Youth Reconnect demonstration in Hamilton that builds on the regional work that Mike Lesky has been doing. Next. And so the research and evaluation, again, it's, it's critical here. Um, so with the, the project Housing First for Youth demonstrations, we're running as a mini at-home shift law project. And we're very fortunate to have Dr. Samson Barris, who um, is the father of Pathways Housing First, um, sign on to the Housing First for Youth model, and he likes to call it Housing First 2.0, um, and to have his support for running this very important trial. And we also have many of the at-home shape law researchers that have come across, um, like Steve says, like a herd of buffalo, um, to work with us to help make this as strong as possible. And we're doing developmental and outcomes evaluation on top of it because we need to understand, um, you know, how is this implemented? What's successful? What gets in the way? Um, how do folks get from A to B? Um, and what are the lessons we can learn there? Next. And really critical here are the outcomes. And so we're developing a very robust outcomes framework that we will be evaluating um, these models to. And we're looking for more, so much more for young people, as Steve said, than just housing stability. We want young people to have uh, uh, what they need to transition healthy into a healthy adulthood, but also we want people to live a good life. The same thing that we would want for our own children and I think that's what we have to keep talking about. Um, and so these outcomes, what's also important is that the outcomes drive the service delivery model. So if you say these are the outcomes we're going for, then we have to ensure that the staff working with the young people have the tools they need to provide the support to get young people to those outcomes. And I'll name again that the voice of young people with lived experience has been very important in the development of all of this work. Next. And so, just to review here before I hand it over to Aon, um, how we're thinking about scaling um, the prevention work in Housing First for Youth is this. And you can go ahead and populate this screen too. Uh, build and support local coalitions using collective impact to deliver on this work at the community level. Support the implementation of the models of prevention in Housing First for Youth. Um, conduct research and evaluation. Build that evidence base for government and funders and then support communities and all orders of government to scale and sustain. And I want to talk about here briefly before I close the role of MARS. MARS is working with us um, to look at how we fund youth homelessness in this country and make some recommendations for how we might do it better. And that does include, you know, looking at some social finance tools and, and how we might use those, but it's really about um, how different orders of government, um, philanthropy, and the private sector can imagine um, taking these kinds of models to scale so that we can truly prevent and end homelessness. Next. There we go. Oh, and I forgot to populate this slide. Aon, I was going to put a picture of you here. And it was going to be so funny, and I completely forgot. Yeah, yeah. So now I'll just turn it over to you. Thank you. I'm sorry we missed that. That would have been a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, hey guys, uh, I'm Aon. I'm, I'm with Coaches for Youth. I'm really excited to be a part of this today, and thank you, Melanie and Steve and CHRA for putting this on. Um, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about what social innovation and youth homelessness sometimes looks like on the ground, and specifically a project that we're working on here in Newfoundland and Labrador. So I'm going to actually start with a little bit of background uh, to situate you guys on what Choices for Youth is and, and what we're trying to do here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, so we're a registered nonprofit charity. We do professional services with at-risk and homeless youth in the community. Um, we were founded in 1990, so we have a, a lot of years of experience in this field, and, and the approach we've taken has kind of changed over the years um, to an in-care model and now to what really is uh, adopting that housing first payment for youth that Stephen only have been talking about. Um, we run multiple services, multiple programs. We have numerous housing options for young people in the city. Um, and we serve about 1,200 young people uh, every single year. And that's actually quite a, quite a lot of young people for a city our size. Um, and so our, our statement in terms of how we work is innovative programming and social enterprise. Ultimately, we're looking at helping young people secure stable housing, stable education, stable employment, while also working towards family stability and better health. And the reason for that is we think those are kind of critical factors in moving forward with your life and setting up a positive trajectory of, of where you want to get to. Uh, next slide, please. So when 
when we talk with the young people we're working with, they're ages 16 to 29, and they are coming from a very difficult place. Um, so we talk about the challenges in, in a young person's life. So they may be disconnected from family, they may experience a lot of conflict with low education levels. Um, often young people are marginalized or discriminated, coming from low income families. Um, mental health and addiction is a big challenge. Um, and experience with child intervention systems. Um, we also see a lot of forms of victimization and abuse. Um, and involvement with the criminal justice system. If we think about what's causing a young person to have those experiences, often this is really related to childhood experiences and childhood trauma. And so a lot of the work we're doing is informed by that trauma, and that's the core part of the approach that we try to take. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different programs. We provide housing, education, employment. Um, social innovation project that we're working on provides an opportunity for us to kind of look beyond the intervention work uh, and immediate support work and look more explicitly around what does really great prevention look like. And in addition to meeting the basic needs of young people, how are we equipping them uh, and setting them up to succeed in their lives? Um, so grounding all of this uh, is a foundational belief that we do believe all young people have the same potential as anyone on this call. And so it doesn't matter kind of your background and the experience you're in, if you're given the right set of supports and the right environment, then you have the opportunity to and so that kind of grounds all of our work and also the, a founding belief in the social innovation project. The key guiding ideas behind this project, um, a lot of what uh, Steve and Melanie have mentioned, that youth homelessness is distinct from adult homelessness. And so we need to take a distinct approach. Uh, the causes of youth homelessness are wide ranging and complex, which means our approach to how we support them and help them move forward needs to be as comprehensive and as complex as the challenges they're facing. Um, and an innovative response can't be done in isolation. So we need to work in partnership. Uh, with other community agencies, uh, with input from young people, and obviously with our government uh, allies. So our social innovation project uh, really focuses on two core objectives. And so the first objective is breaking intergener intergenerational cycles of homelessness within vulnerable young families. Um, and the second objective is creating low barrier, high support employment opportunities for at risk and homeless youth. So you can see how that first one um, really takes a really high level broad view on Breaking intergenerational cycles is really about prevention here. And when we talk about creating employment opportunities, that's about looking forward and how do you help somebody move forward towards, towards their life goals. Um, we designed this project to fill gaps in services or opportunities that we saw with the population we're working with. It was also designed to address specific leverage points. So where can we intervene to have the maximum impact uh, on a family, on a young person, and on the system? So I'm going to go into each of these objectives in a little bit more detail. Uh, and share some of the nuances of the work. So the first objective um, is, is really looking at supporting vulnerable families. Uh, when we look at the young people we're working with, about 67% of the youth we work with have past or present involvement with the child protection system. And we know, as Steve said earlier, uh, the average age of a young person's experience of homelessness in St. John's is just 16. So that kind of gives you a sense that something is going wrong somewhere early down the pipeline and starting with families. So when we look at that and we think of what needs to be done here, we need to take a, an approach that kind of wraps support around that family. Uh, apprehension has been a, a, a increasing at an alarming rate in our province. And absolutely, sometimes uh, apprehension is the thing to do for safety, for, for positive outcomes. But what we're finding is in the last few years, it's become just the default go-to option. So if a family is struggling, if there's any kind of issue, Rather than surrounding that family with support, what we've seen is a really big spike in apprehension. Apprehensions are extremely costly, extremely traumatic. Uh, it's generally a very poor outcome for the families and for the kids. Uh, in Newfoundland, the graduation rate among kids who were apprehended is less than 3%. You can see how a really expensive intervention can sometimes result in really poor outcomes. So the work in this area is taking a different approach. We're doing that in two ways in this area of work. One is our Mama Moments program. So this is a proven model. We actually started piloting this program a few years ago, um, and now we're at a stage where we can really scale it up and formalize some of the mechanisms within it. Um, mom Moments focuses on vulnerable, at-risk, um, pregnant and young parenting moms and their children. Uh, it's very future-oriented. It's community-based while also providing wraparound support. Um, so we have a group of young moms. They, they meet weekly where there's a peer-to-peer -peer support element. Uh, there's a community-building element, uh, kind of recognizing that other young families are facing the same challenges. Um, and that builds a sense of community and reduces isolation. At the same time, outside of that, there's a lot of uh, wraparound support. So what 
whatever it is that that young mom needs to, to be a great parent, to find a job, to work on her education, um, to deal with uh, legal issues or, or around uh, custody, we'll kind of play a role wherever we can to make sure they can be the best parent possible. Uh, what this achieves really is, uh, is twofold. We're intervening to ensure that that family is set on the right track and that we can help them make some positive choices. Um, but it's also a big element of prevention. If you think about the young uh, kids in, in those programs, um, we're, by, by working with the young moms and the families, we're ideally av avoiding uh, a number of, of negative experiences for those kids and able to intervene in that cycle and stop it in its tracks. So if you think about um, like what have we achieved with this in our pilot phase and now that we're expanding it, well, right now the program has uh, around 47 young moms and about 56 kids. Um, and since it started, um, there were most of the children in that, in that associated with those moms were in care. Uh, and now they're all with their families again. Do you think what the impact that has on those children, on those moms, and in terms of what they think is possible with their lives? So it's, it's a tremendous savings on the system, but a tremendous impact on that family. And the other thing we're looking at is the Family Reconnect program. So this is a brand new program. Uh, the core recommendation is in the Housing First Framework for Youth. And what this is is identifying within a young person who's potentially at risk or feeling isolated or uh, heading down uh, a tricky path is who is it, who is in their life that could act as a adult figure that we could connect them with as a family member. So family doesn't mean mom or dad necessarily. It could be an aunt or uncle. It could be a cousin that they used to hang out with a lot and have a high degree of trust with. And so our job in that case becomes facilitating that reconnection, doing some counseling work, um, reducing isolation. Uh, and it's a form of housing work, essentially, while also providing the wraparound support. On both of these programs, you'll notice that they've integrated with other choices for youth services. And that's absolutely critical because we can't pick and choose what barriers we're going to address on any given day. So you may, you could be a part of the Model Moments program while accessing our, our, our food that we've provided outreach, while accessing our housing options if you needed it. Um, so, so there's a recognition that whatever barriers come up, we'll work to, to address those barriers. Um, next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, sorry, I think I just had a lag. Okay, so the other area of work is, is transitional employment. So this is the more um, kind of, that, that was the prevention one, and this is kind of how do we set people up to move forward. Um, so we're looking at creating low barrier, high support employment opportunities for young people. So if you look at what's happening in our province here, with the young people we're working with, um, of the population we work with, about 4.8% of them have completed high school. So they don't have a high education uh, development to rely on. They don't have a lot of opportunities in front of them. Uh, and for the most part, 76% uh, of the youth we work with are unemployed. Um, if you think of what this does to development, the confidence, the opportunity, and where they need to go, uh, there's a lot standing in their way. The way we're approaching this is twofold. And I'll kind of talk about these two programs in tandem because they're very interlinked. Um, so one of them is the Centralized Employment Support Program. And the simplest way, way to put this is we do everything we can to help the young person succeed at work. And we address the real barriers they're facing. Um, because if you're working, if you're making work on time, if you're earning an income, it's more likely you're going to maintain housing. Uh, and so the young people we're working with, what's standing in their way is not the whether or not they have a great resume. It's not whether or not they're prepped for interviews. Uh, there's a lot more complex needs that they're working with. Um, and sometimes the, the, the successes in that can look very different. Um, so when we talk about supporting them on the job or pre-employment, it could mean helping them get up in the morning, it could mean getting them to and from work, it could mean they're challenged with their addictions and they can take a two-hour break from their uh, from their day and go to a methadone appointment that will take them to, help them debrief after, bring them back to work. It could mean that we're supporting them with breakfast and lunches. Uh, it could mean skills development and GED. So we try to do a full spectrum of what may be needed. Um, Pre-employment aspects of this is if, if you're not ready for traditional employment, it's a chance to get your feet wet, build a community, build some skills, experience different elements of what employment looks like, responsibility, showing up on time, uh, group dynamics, and then there's obviously on-the-job support. So as you're working, how do you navigate the workplace? How do you succeed in the workplace? How are you professional in the workplace? Alongside that, you can work on your GED, so you can get your high school diploma. The other part of it is, is what we call pre-social enterprise training. Um, so, and I'll get into that a little bit when I talk about the social enterprises. But ultimately, as you kind of 
are supported by this program, you're able to avail of the support you need based on your level of need. And that's what I mean by tier-based support in the slide. So where you start, the assumption is you need a high level of support and you will also be low level of skill. And as you work through that program, the level of support you need goes down drastically and the level of skill that you have goes up significantly. So it begs the question, where are these young people working? Who's going to hire an at-risk youth who doesn't have the high school diploma and who has a lot of challenges in their life? And this is where our social enterprise work comes into play. Our social enterprises are designed to create those employment opportunities. So we're looking at a diverse sector to give people uh, a chance and a taste of different types of jobs. Uh, we're currently operating three social enterprises. One is a construction company, uh, one is a, a retail uh, clothing store, and the other is a it's essentially a production facility that's currently building hydroponic uh, produce growers. So there are very different types of jobs that you can have access. If I go back to that pre-social enterprise training component, what that lets you do is, is kind of experience each of those almost like you would as an intern uh, while building up some skill, while building a diversity of experiences, um, and, and, and getting, getting a sense of what do I want to do. So the element of choice is really important. In housing, we talk about having choice in housing. We want to start broadening out the, the, the diversity of our employment options so there's some choice in what you want to work on. Uh, as you go to work, you're obviously receiving all that support. And as you go through that tier system of how much support do you need and what's your skill level, we actually change the uh, rate of pay. So there's a direct correlation of how much of work you're able to take on and how much support you need. Um, so it is aligned with the kind of uh, hourly rate that you can expect to receive. The, the really great thing with social enterprises is they're also designed to be sustainable. So we're creating employment options that are sustainable. Um, the whole point of these are transitional employment spaces. So this isn't a full-time permanent job for someone in the construction industry. It's a job that you're probably going to be in for a while. And as you develop your skills and you work through your barriers, our goal is to get you poached or get you a job somewhere else. Uh, but in the meantime, we're able to run this enterprise to fund that support work um, and also help you build those skills. The, the way we look at it is that there's, there's a lot of work out there uh, that you can do for a, a, a multiplied impact. If you think about our construction company, for example, um, if we're going to build housing development, why not build them in a way that also trains and employs young people? Uh, and we also have this attitude in other areas of, of our work. If we provide meals that are outreach centers. If we're going to provide meals, why not create that as an experiential opportunity to learn about food safety and budgeting and, and serving? So we looked at all these opportunities, as well as market opportunities, are analyzing which ones are, are suitable to be turned into enterprises. So these two teams work really closely together. On the social enterprise side, they're looking at the business development, market analysis, uh, generating customers. Uh, and a, a, a big part of the partnership is how do you design, design the job so that it is suitable for that risk. So you can take a job and just throw someone in, or you can design the job to work for someone with high barriers. And that's, that's where some of the talent and innovation comes from. Um, in the last year in this program, we've generated over 18,000 hours of employment for at risk youth. Uh, and you think about what that means for their for their livelihood, for their experience, for their confidence. Um, and on average, at Impact Construction, it's about a year and a half that we see in terms of the time it takes from them to entering the construction company, moving on to other full-time employment. Next slide. So when we think about, um, you know, so what of this program? What are we achieving? The, the traditional way to look at this is the numbers. The numbers are actually quite important. So across our social innovation project, we can look at you know, how many young people are, are receiving the support, how many have completed their GED, how many went through that pre-employment training, how many secured a job, how many secured housing, and we maintain it after three months, six months, 12 months. And those indicators are actually quite important, and we're tracking all of those. Um, but there's also some other interesting questions we can ask, like how many hours of employment did we generate? Did we see improvements in their mental health? Um, did we see an increase in the support network table to avail of? Was there a reduction in shelter use overall? And so this leads into what we're trying to add as, an, as a really critical part of our uh, reporting and impact measurement. Next slide, please. Is the social return on investment. And so what this does is it's essentially mapping our intended outcomes and the avoided negative outcomes against financial proxies. So we look at our program model. We turn that into a logic model. The logic model, you know, looking at your inputs, looking at your activity, looking at your indicators, looking at your outcomes, and the assumptions within that. And we're able to list up, okay, what are the intended outcomes we want to achieve? 
but we can also very explicitly look at what are it that we're trying to avoid. And we, look, we can look at regional data, at local data, on, on what is reasonable to expect on a, on a particular trajectory, what's the cost of doing nothing, what, what do we expect is going to happen in this young person's life, uh, and what's the financial proxy associated with that. So for example, if we help someone uh, secure housing and maintain employment and move on to full-time employment uh, and work on their mental health, well, they're probably going to have stable housing. They're probably going to become a tax contributor. Um, they're probably not accessing the shelter. Uh, if they have a family, they may be able to reconnect with their family and reduce the cost on the system for child apprehension. As they start working, they're coming off the impact support, uh, income support. Um, so there's a lot of ways to kind of look at the impact that we're having. Uh, just as you build stability into somebody's life, there's probably lower rates of emergency healthcare use, uh, just less crises overall. And so when you look at monetizing that value, you can actually look at the dollar for dollar impact. What is the social return on the investment? So this is a key way to kind of demonstrate the impact to funders um, in terms of here's the cost of doing absolutely nothing. If you don't do anything, here's what's going to happen and here's what it's going to cost you. So a really great example might be a vulnerable young family that's struggling. If you do nothing, here's what's going to likely happen to the, to the parents and here's what likely what's going to happen to the child with the apprehension. And then we know the outcomes of that apprehension is a 3% graduation rate, and here's the lifelong cost of what that can mean. Or we could implement a program like this, and here's the cost of the program, and here's what we think that can achieve. So there's a really interesting way to look at this, uh, to look at the return on investment. We're working with a company right now to kind of formalize the metrics around this, um, and it's important that this is really complementing existing impact report. Uh, storytelling, narrative-driven, and indicators are all going to be a critical part of the impact reporting. Uh, SROI gives us yet another tool that's really valuable to talk about the impact. Uh, next slide. So part of the social innovation project is also recognizing that we're in St. John's, and, and many of you might relate to this, uh, we're a service hub. But the issues that families are facing, that young people are facing, exist well beyond urban areas, into rural communities, uh, into areas where they, there might not be service centers. Um, so for us, what that means is looking at how do we share that knowledge and share that capacity across the problem? How do we learn from other communities? Um, and, and really the why behind that is a lot of young people are migrating to St. John's for services. And along the way, they're becoming more and more isolated from their original support networks. And they're obviously building, burning bridges along the way. Uh, so by the time they've arrived at Choices for Youth, uh, and sometimes they're arriving on a bus with a garbage bag at our shelter. At that point, it's often too late, and, it, and there's a lot of work to do, and, and there's, there's successful interventions and changes you can make in their lives, but what would be better is being able to intervene earlier in that person's life, being able to intervene closer to home in that person's life. Uh, so that's what we know about in terms of intervening closer to home. So what are we doing right now as part of this project? We're in right now mostly learning. We're engaging with rural communities. We're trying to analyze different challenges and different opportunities that are unique to communities. Um, but this information, this uh, insight, as well as what we're learning from our program, it feeds into what expansion could look like, and also into our work around building a provincial plan to end these homelessness. There's a lot of momentum at the governmental level here to see some changes in policy that can uh, really make a difference in vulnerable families and young people, uh, and so this information kind of feeds into that. Uh, also, what we're looking at as part of this project is to be operational um, in some sort over the next three years with six sites across the province, uh, and with a real purpose of why and what are we trying to do there and with who, with, with, with which partners. And the model can vary. In some cases, that might be we open up shop, like the satellite office. In some cases, it could be capacity building or having folks come to us and do job shadowing and us sending folks over for a period of time. Uh, it could be co-funding uh, projects and writing and, and being partners on a funding application. So the model could look very different depending on where we're at. Um, the last thing I'll say is, you know, in, in all of this work, it's, it's really important that when we talk about learnings and we talk about the impact, um, you know, Melanie and Steve both mentioned how partnership is a really key part of what needs to happen across Canada and across the community. So we need to take the information we know and what we're learning um, and not only share it with each other, uh, but also use it to inform policy. And, and so that's happening in wonderful ways in the national level. Uh, I think we need to find creative ways to do it on the regional level. For us, that's meant being active in spaces where we can be consultants uh, on new policy development. Uh, so whether that's looking at eligibility, eligibility criteria, whether it's looking at housing development, mental health policies, 
um, or looking at educational outcomes, uh, these are really critical insights that our sector has that we can really help inform good policy, uh, which ties into uh, the broader plan to end youth homelessness. Because we know that it's, it's much more than just housing and bricks and mortar. It is, it's, it's a very complex issue that requires a comprehensive set of policy. So we hope our work can, can lend to that and make a difference uh, in the province. Um, yeah, and, and, and I'm glad I could share that with you guys today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Steve, Melly, and Aeon. Sorry for uh, some of the <laughs> small issues with the presentation uh, slide changing. But uh, right now, I'd like to open up the floor to any comments or questions that our, our listeners may have. So basically, please type them in the dialog box on your control panel if you haven't already, um, and we'll take as many as we can. So I see that... Uh, all right, so, yeah, please just, uh, if you have questions, just type them into the dialog box and we'll start answering them. Aeon's looking for some particularly tricky questions, so if you can think of those, that would be helpful. And I think the first comment should be to congratulate on us all for sticking to the time. <laughs> yes, that was, uh, that was very impressive. Thank you very much. I do have one question, um, and I believe this is from Melanie. What is the name of that report that you, uh, that you mentioned that's being released the, on October the 10th? The Housing First I, for Youth it, Guide, it, I think. Does, does someone want to use it before we launch it? No, just kidding. <laughs> no, it's, it's the document. It's basically um, taking the framework that we just discussed and it turns it into a program model guide. And so it will just be called This is Housing First for Youth, a program model guide. And what's interesting in the process of getting to that guide, uh, there's been all kinds of uh, partnership and engagement. We, we worked with people in Canada to look very carefully at the program model, how it's operationalized, to review the core principles, which have been revised a fair bit. Uh, we engage with the, uh, people in Europe who are doing this work um, in different countries, from Belgium to Ireland to, to Scotland and elsewhere, Finland, that kind of thing. And then the United States we did as well with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness and the National Network for Youth. Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, consultation with uh, service providers and, and uh, you know, policymakers from very different contexts, and we're working towards, uh, you know, having a, a common vision for what Housing First for Youth looks like that will be international in scope. All right, that's very interesting. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to give a couple more minutes to anyone who has questions. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll do my little uh, ending spiel, but if you do have questions, please type them away and uh, we will, oh, here we have a question. Um, so I have a question asking, and I'm not sure who this question, I, I assume it's to, to all of you. The question is, are you looking for program partners such as life skills instruction is the question that's being asked. This might be something for offline, but. Oh, yeah, I think that that, that question, um, is life skills programming an important part of these models? I would yes. say, yeah, of course, in terms of the, the supports that we provide to young people. If someone's asking, do you want a life skills partner, let it be me, you know, just send an email. <laughs> yeah, and most certainly as these, like, part of the, what we're trying to achieve is taking these programs, whether they're preventive, uh, early intervention programs or Housing First for Youth, taking them to scale. So within different communities, um, there will be needs for Housing First for Youth providers to to be able to offer that kind of support. And, so and that's through probably partnership, and through partnership is the only way that that, that can happen, right? For uh, sure. And I, I think for us, life skills is, is absolutely critical part of the employment programming. Um, what's important for us is recognizing what, what, what's the reasonable starting point for the population we're working with. Um, some of the challenges we've had with traditional life skills programming is it's looking at things like budgeting and nutrition and using the internet and, and writing skills. And those are actually really important, but for us it's important to start with the level of the complexity that we're seeing. Um, so things like 
setting your alarm clock and getting up in the morning, uh, making your appointments, um, getting through the day, um, or, or taking a time out if you're feeling particularly stressed. Uh, so for us, life skills initially looked quite different. Um, and then it's, it's a kind of following that path along as, as the barriers are addressed in, in working with more traditional programs. All right. Well, thank you for that. Um, question box is still open, so definitely type away your questions if you have any. Um, I'd like to give many thanks from all of us here at CHRA to uh, Steve, Melanie, and Jan for further time in speaking with us today. I And I have another question for them. <laughs> oh, okay. This is, a, this is a question actually to, to all of us, and yes, um, uh, the question is, will the presentations be shared? And the answer is yes. Steve, Melanie, and Aeon all agreed that, uh, that we will be posting their presentations in a PDF format on our website in the next couple of days, as well as um, a recording of this webinar will also be posted online um, at CHRA's website. So that's answering that question. So I'd like to uh, thank also the audience for participating and just a little spiel about the next webinar. It's um, on October the 25th when we'll be joined by Enbridge to talk about their energy efficiency and affordable housing programs. Um, if you check out CHRA's website at chra-achru.ca um, slash programs, there's more information on them there. And don't forget to put forward your proposals for CHRA's 50th Annual Congress taking place in Ottawa next year from April 24th to the 27th. The call for proposals closes on September 29th, and there's more information on CHRA's website. Like I already answered, today's presentation will also be made available on our website in the next few days. You'll also receive an email with a link to a survey that CHRA would um, very much appreciate if you take the time to fill out. It's very short. <laughs> thank you, and again, thank you to the speakers, and I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye for now. Thank you.